is good all the time he put a song of praise in this heart of mine god is good all the time through the darkest night his light will shine god is good he's so good all the time if you're walking through the valley there are shadows all around do not fear for he will guide you he will keep you safe and sound for he has promised to never leave you nor forsake you and his word is true god is good all the time he put a song of praise in this heart of mine god is good all the time through the darkest night his light will shine god is good he's so good all the time we were sinners and so unworthy still for us he chose to die he filled us with his holy spirit now we can stand and testify that his love is everlasting and his mercies they will never hallelujah god is good all the time he put a song of praise in this heart of mine god is good all the time through the darkest night his light will shine god is good he's so good all the time if you're walking through the valley and there are shadows all around do not fear for he will guide you he will keep you safe and sound for he has promised to never leave you nor forsake you and his word is true god is good all the time put a song of praise in this heart of mine god is good all the time through the darkest night his light will shine god is good he's so good all the time we were sinners and so unworthy 
But still for us he chose to Thank you Lord He filled us with his Holy Spirit Now we can stand and testify That his love is everlasting And his mercies They will never Hallelujah God is good All the time he put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, His light will shine. God is good. He's so good all the time. Oh, God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, His light will shine. God is good. He's so good all the time. And though I may not understand all the plans you have for me, of faith I can clearly see God is good all the time yes you are you put a song of praise in this heart of mine God is good all the time through the darkest night his light will shine God is good he is so good all the time and though I may not understand all the plans you have for me but my life is in your hands and through the eyes of faith I can clearly see God is good yes he is all the time he put a song of praise in his heart of mine God is good all the time through the darkest night his light will shine. God is good. He's so good all the time. Yes, he's good. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, his light will shine. God is good. He's so good all the time is he good tonight give him a shout of praise lord you are good hallelujah come on lift a shout of praise to him tonight we lift a shout of praise lord be glorified in this place Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We give you all the glory and the honor and the praise, Lord. Be exalted in our praise, Lord. For you are good, you are good, you are good. And your mercy endures forever. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be your name. Oh, how beautiful are you, Lord. Yes, Lord. It's your words. Go and go. It's your love. Yes, hallelujah. Oh, how glorious. Are you, Lord? It's your power. It was your cross. Glory. Oh, that saved me. And you rescued me. Just a moment there. You set me free. One touch of your hand. I give you glory, glory. Give you glory, glory. I give you glory, glory. Hallelujah. Jesus, be glorified. I give you glory, glory. I give you glory, glory. Hallelujah. I give you glory, glory. Jesus. Oh, how beautiful. Are you, Lord? 
It's your power It was your cross Oh, that saved me Yeah, and you rescued me Just a moment there You set me free
Jesus, we give you praise. Hallelujah. We give you praise in honor, Lord. Be glorified in this place. Jesus, oh, I give you glory, glory. I give you glory. Have your way, Lord. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, sweet lamb, sweet lamb, be glorified. Oh, oh hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Take hold of the atmosphere. Come in charge of the atmosphere, Lord. Come in charge of the atmosphere with your glory, Lord.
There is only one desire in the heart of your Step deeper in the place where earth and heaven be. We step, Lord, with a sound and like rushing waters. We sing blessing, honor, and praise.
Come on, come on, lift him up, praise. Worship him now, hallelujah. Stir it up, Lord, stir it up. Stir the waters, Lord. Stir the waters, Lord. Stir the waters, Lord. sing holy holy
are holy, O oh Lord. You are holy. We join our voices with the elders and the angels crying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Holy, you are holy, Lord. Holy, worthy. You are worthy. Mm. Holy, holy, holy. Oh, Lord, you're holy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you have a need tonight by the lifting of the hand? All over the building, out across the web stream, the Lord knows your needs. Hold them in your heart as we pray. Fell ill. Brother Jim Portillo fell ill in the night. He flew home. We want to remember our brother to the Lord. Father, what a privilege to stand in your presence. So we are just trying to find the rhythms of the river. Lord, I thank you that you are beautiful and lovely and you do all things well. Father, how thankful we are that we could gather together tonight with saints of like precious faith, that we could bring our praise, our adoration for you. Lord, may you be lifted up on our praises. Lord, we thank you that you chose to be lifted up above the earth one time for the sins of mankind. But Lord, may that, that will never, that will never happen again. But we lift you up, Lord, with our praise. We glorify you with our praise and our worship, O oh God, because you are worthy. You are worthy to receive glory and honor and praise. Father, you see the needs all over the building tonight and out across web stream you see God the needs of the people each one of them Lord is important to you some physical some Lord are dealing with emotional needs tonight 
depression and oppression, but I thank you, Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit that can be lifted off even this night in your presence. Lord, I... Once again, remember the Weems family to you, asking you to minister your love and strength to them. Comfort them in this hour. Lord, we ask you to be with Brother Jim Portio and ask God that you would touch him and minister to him in his physical body, in his spirit. God, every need, I thank you that you supply it. We give you glory and honor, Lord. Whatever you want to do in this service, Lord, we'll do our best to yield to you. Oh, Jesus. (laughs) Jesus. Jesus. What a lovely savior you are. I thank you for your man's servant that you've chosen to minister the word tonight. Pray your heavy anointing upon him and upon us. God, that he would be able to deliver what you have placed upon his heart and that we would be able to pull, that we would be able to receive from your hand. Every song may it glorify you. The offering, Lord, that we give, may it glorify you. For it is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Would you give him a wonderful clap of praise as you find your way back to your seat tonight? How we love you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. 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 Sister Jaya, they tell me you have a song. Will you come? We welcome each one of you into the house of the Lord. How blessed we are that you're here. We're glad to be gathered together with you to see the Lord move among us. And do great and mighty things. Brother Brent, Sister Trish, we're sure glad to have you all from Tucson. The Lord bless you. All of our visitors that were here last night and were recognized, we're so glad that you stayed. Brother, they tell me it's not pronounced Spanish, so let me try. Brother Jean... And Sister Fiona Arnoldis from South Africa, we are so glad to have you here with us. God bless you. Hallelujah. God bless you, Sister Jaya, as you sing.
you're holy. Lord, you're holy. Let the dove come and rest in the Christ in me. Holy. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Brother Jean, why don't you come and greet the church tonight? We're so glad that you and your wife would come this far to be a part of us. God bless you, brother. Hallelujah. Can we say amen? Amen. Praise God. I greet each and every one in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. What an honor and privilege to be here in the house of the Lord. I also bring special greetings from South Africa, from the bride that side, to all of you here. It's so wonderful to be in the presence of the Lord. Is that right? You know, Brother Brennan said there was nobody and nothing to worship him. He wanted to be God in the beginning. He desired to be God. But there was no hands, no voices, no feet to dance. And then he created us to make him God. Amen. And we're not ashamed to make him God tonight. Is that right? I'm not ashamed to shout and jump and dance to make him God. I can tell you Christ is not unwelcome in this church. He's welcome here. We can feel him. The person of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I was just reading a, a scripture there in Greek. In Hebrew it means praise. It means also to brag on God. Amen. To brag on the Lord. And I was just thinking, you know, if you don't praise God, you're not bragging on your God. But amen, if you know that he's a healer, a redeemer, a savior, I mean, you will praise him. You will brag that he's a healer. How many can brag tonight that our God is a deliverer? He's a healer and a redeemer. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Brother Man says this message is already inspired. He says, but you need to be inspired. And when an inspired man picks up the inspired word, there will be results. I feel this camp meeting is inspired by God. And we know this message of the hour is already inspired. And our God is not dead, but he is alive. 
Amen. And we hear amen to worship him and to honor him. I always tell the church, God had to make up his mind when he, how he's going to come down from heaven to earth. And he had to make up his mind. He had to decide, how will I come down? And you know, God made, and Brother Abraham says, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. When he did it like this the first time, he should do it like that the second time, the third time, and all the time. Is that right? Amen. So he made up his mind. He will come through the tribe of Judah. And Judah means praise. He came through praise. Brother, when you don't feel the Lord, you just start praising him. Wherever you are, whatever area in your life, if you don't feel the Lord, you just start praising him. And I'm telling you, he's bound to come down. Amen. Because he comes through our praises. Is that right? Praise the name of the Lord. He's born out of the tribe of Judah. And the symbol for Judah is a lion. So when you praise God, there must be a roar in your worship. Amen. The devil must hear the lion roaring. You can't worship like a mouse softly. Amen. Because your praises should sound like a lion. And when the enemy hears that in your amen, there's a roar. In your hallelujah, there's a roar. Then God knows that's a true worship. Is that right? Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. So we're just excited. Amen. I'm overwhelmed. I don't want to be here too long. Amen. I'm, I'm just overexcited. You know, 2020, when the pandemic came, it was so significant and so prophetic. Because 20, if you multiply 20 with 20, it gives you 400. And God, in Genesis 15, he said, after 400 years, I'll take my people out on an exodus. Is that wonderful? Amen. After 400 years. And on 2020, the pandemic came. It was so prophetic. Brother Ram says, God keep on repeating. Amen. Hallelujah. He's a God that repeats his prophecies. He's not just a God of history. He repeats his history. Amen. And after 400 years, year, amen, came God to get uh, Israel out of with the exodus. And it happened after 400 years. And how did it happen with the pandemics? In year 2020, you can see that when you count it together, you get the year 400. You get the number 400. And that means, amen, that 2020, when that happened, amen, it was significant. Because it shows us the exodus for the bride is on. Amen. And God told Moses, he told Moses this. He said, Moses, I'm going to take my people out. I'm going to do wonders. But when I studied that word wonders, I couldn't understand how God can say, I'll take my people out with wonders. But when the wonders came, it was actually pandemics. It was plague behind plague, plague after plague. But how can God say he's going to take them out with wonders? You see, to the Egyptians, it was plagues. But to his people, it was wonders. Can somebody shout and say amen? Oh, brother, to the world, the pandemic was chaos. But for us, it was supernatural wonders. Because God came on the scene to show He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I'm so excited. I told the people, amen, after 400 years. But the redeemed time was exactly 430 years. So the exodus took place after 430 years. And Moses, he told Abram for after 400 years. But in the book of Exodus and Leviticus, you can read, it was after 430 years. And what God did in the first Exodus, you can study all the Exodus. But it says it's the same. What happened in the first Exodus will happen in the second Exodus, will happen in the third Exodus. God sent him a prophet in the first Exodus. In the second Exodus, Jesus was the prophet. And in our Exodus, God sent William Branham as our prophet. But I want to show you something there, just quickly, Pastor, if I can. 430 years. And it's amazing, after the book of Malachi, for 400 years, there were no visions, no dreams. There was no prophecies. It was quiet. They call it the silent God for 400 years. Oh, but then the angel Gabriel came. Amen. What the prophecy? That the Redeemer will be born. But Jesus only functioned after 30 years. So if you look into that, amen, you get the year 430 again. After Malachi to the book of Matthew, 400 years of silence. But the angel said that the Messiah will be born. And after 30 years, he stepped into his Levitical hood. Exactly 430 years again. And I tell the people, can it be in this Exodus that 2020 is the year you can count it 400 prophetically. But if you look at 2020, it's like a countdown to 2030. Then you get the number again, 430. I'm not making dates. We don't know the day and the hour. But I just want to pinch you. But I'm says, pinch yourself. The coming of the Lord is close. 
He said, there's two great things happening now. He said, it's running out of time and it's the coming of the Lord. And I'm telling you, brother, he's closer than close can ever be. The Lord is coming and may God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Don't miss tomorrow night. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I don't want to miss no any nights. I want to be here to get everything that God is doing among us. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We're going to receive the offering tonight. You give as giving unto the Lord for the purposes of the kingdom. Might I remind you, we have service here uh, tonight, of course, and then tomorrow night at 7, Friday night at 7, Saturday night at 6 o'clock, Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, and then we're going to have a memorial service for Sister Royale here on Monday night at 6, 6 o'clock. We want to come and just remember our sister and uh, we're going to miss her, but we're thankful that she's not having to be in a pained body any longer. God is faithful. He's true. He's merciful. And we love him. If you brought an offering with you, I might remind you that Sunday we are going to receive an, uh, a special offering on the principle of the mortgage of this building, it being the first Sunday of the month for us. Uh, we are so happy to see this loan balance down to $26,521.12. And we're believing this debt will be gone by the end of 2023. That is the goodness of the Lord to us. We've got $441,468 behind us. We're just thankful for what God has done. It is, his, it is Him. He has done it. And we bless him. Amen. Jesse and Stephen, will you two brothers, one stand here and one stand here. We'll let the people bring their offering and give as giving unto the Lord tonight. The blood shall never lose its power. It reaches to the highest mountain. Thank you, Lord. The blood that Jesus shed. For me, way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength from death.
Thank you so much. I want you to turn in your Bibles this evening. We are so thankful for the musicians. I would love to sing. There's a great anointing here for singing, but I have a, I have a lot of hay on my fork and one, about one hour to get it off. So I've got I've to move along this evening. I hope you'll keep up with me. I received an inspiration in the service last night. When Brother Greeley was preaching about uh, many wonderful, beautiful things, but he mentioned just briefly the eyes of the Lord, and it stirred my heart, and God began to talk to me today about the eyes of the bride. I want to talk about your eyes tonight. Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs, as I like to call it. Because that's what Solomon called it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Song of Songs, chapter 3 and verse 6. Who is this that cometh out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all powders of the merchant? Now let's turn to Revelation chapter 19, and we're going to read verse 7, 8, and 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Something has transitioned the bride to wife. Something had to take place to move her from the realm of espousal engagement to being the wife. She had made herself ready, and to her was granted. She didn't get it on her own, find it somewhere, pay for it. It was given to her. It was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of of saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Are you with me tonight? Then I want us to go to Song of Songs, chapter 8. I just felt impressed that we remain standing for, for for the rest of this reading. 
Verse 5, who is this that cometh up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? I raised thee up under the apple tree. There thy mother brought thee forth. There she brought thee forth that bare thee. Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. For love is strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be contemned. And then finally, Song of Songs, chapter 7 and verse 4. Thy neck is a tower of ivory. Thine eyes like the fish pools in Heshbon. By the gate of Bath Rabim, thy nose is as the tower of Lebanon, which looketh toward Damascus. Father, I thank you tonight that we are, every one of us here, by assignment. We didn't just think, well, we, we might go over there and attend a meeting or two, but we are here because we felt the inspired call. You have placed within each one of us a desire to be here, and you have met us already, and you have come tonight as we worshiped you, as we welcomed your presence into this house. And now, Lord, in your name and under your authority, we command every spirit to bow yourself to the authority and the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. You have no place in this service. We pray right now that our minds will be open that our eyes will be anointed with eye salve, that we might catch a glimpse of how you are forming our eyes in this hour. You spoke to me and said, I am forming the eyes of my wife in this hour. I am forming the eyes of my bride in this hour. And so, Lord, talk to us tonight. I know that the people are tired. Many were up way before the sun today. They have worked all day and only had a minute, maybe not even a minute to sit down before they came into the house tonight. But there are needs among us that need to be ministered to. There are those streaming this service who need a word from you, O oh Lord. So I ask that you anoint the faith pool of your people right now, that you would talk to us. We don't need a sermonette. We need a message. We need a clarion call. We need a clear voice to talk to us tonight. And we will give you the glory and the honor and the praise, for it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. And the saint said, Amen. before you're seated, I want you to lift up a roar of praise to the Lord again. Just one more time, I want you to rattle the enemy. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, Jesus. You may be seated. Most of us here have an understanding already that Jesus loved the church and gave himself for her. Amen? We also know in this house that there is a remnant found among that church that has been chosen, predestinated as his bride to not only be given eternal life, 
but chosen to overcome the spirit of this last age. Can you say amen? In the message, The Voice of the Sign, paragraph 23, Brother Branham said, now the type here, there is a wonderful type that we sure don't want to miss. See, type. God was bringing Israel, his people, out. A nation. I want you to look at this next phrase. A nation out. A nation out of a nation. A beautiful type of today that God is calling his bride out of a church. We are a church called out of a church. We are a bride that has been called out of a church. God is calling his bride out of a church, Christian bride, out of a Christian church. A bride, church, out of a church which is called in the Bible or it's referred to in the Bible. We know by the word of the Lord that she is not only espoused as a bride to him, but the scripture specifically describes her as a chaste virgin. Do you believe that? I want you to stay with me in the foundation. 2 Corinthians 11 and 2. For I am jealous... Paul says, I am jealous over you, not with a carnal jealousy, but with a godly jealousy, for it has become my responsibility, he's saying, for I have espoused you to, not to a bishop, not to a pope, not to a top 10 in the message list, but I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a, you read it for me, a chaste virgin to Christ. A chaste virgin is one who is not defiled by fornication and uncleanness. This is how we're going to do it. I'm going to say it, and if you believe it, you're going to amen it. So we can move quick. You want to start over? A chaste virgin is one. Look, the only way I can get 13 pages in tonight is stay close to my notes. And the only way we can flow is I'll do my thing, you do your thing, if you believe it. Don't just blindly say amen. But if it strikes your heart, you respond. We're, we're going to be kind of liturgical. Has, has any of you been in a church where they had a liturgy? And you get up, and, and the, uh, the, the priest or whoever, he would read a verse, and then the people would have a stanza of response. Anybody, anybody been in church? And then one more statement, would be, and the people, that's how we're going to do it tonight. We're going to be very, very ecclesiastical in our support. I'm going to say it. If you believe it, you're going to respond. A chaste virgin is one who is not defiled by fornication and uncleanness. A chaste virgin is one who is a spouse to a husband and greatly loved by him. A chaste virgin is one who is longing for the wedding day to arrive. A chaste virgin is one who prizes all expressions and tokens of love from the espouse. She does not despise or reject any of his love gifts. If he offers it, she wants it. If he hangs it over our head, we reach up by faith and take a hold of it. We don't want any of it to pass us by. We know that the Omega bride must be like the Alpha bride, but she comes with a double portion because she has seen her day. She has recognized the day that she's living in and the message for that day. A chaste virgin is one who delights to hear as often as possible from her espoused. Once a week is not enough for her. Twice a week is not enough for her. She constantly desires to hear him whisper his love to her day and night. Is that all right? In the message, Scriptural Signs of the Time, paragraph 42, 
He said, but remember, the bride will be a called out, separated, and different, filled, Holy Ghost born, washed in the blood of the Lamb. She'll abstain from everything that's filthy around her husband. She is a chaste virgin, pure by the word. You see, what's so powerful about this word is it restores virginity. It restores chastity to someone who has already taken a seed from some denominational system out there. Somebody who's been raped by the church. I'm going to talk a little plain now. She's been raped by the church, and yet she was waiting all the time to get to her husband. And when the word comes, she sees herself as filthy and unworthy, but the word begins to wash her. It begins to cleanse her. It begins to restore her membrane. He turns her bloody issue backwards. He restores her membrane. She stands before God in this hour, no matter how many spiritual lovers she's had. She stands virgin and chaste and pure because he sent a pure word. You can never be purified by a mixed word. It can't be man and God. It can't be the message and man. It has to be the pure revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that can restore us back. Are you with me? Are you with me? The word and her are the same. As a man and his wife becomes one in union. When a man lays with his wife, they become one in something holy and sacred. How dare you take it? How dare you take it before it belongs to you? How dare us? Take something so holy and so sacred for our own pleasure. Before we have the contract, before we have the ketubah. So we have most all of us failed. Somewhere along the way, we have, we have failed. I, I, I know that, you know, sometimes the message people can be so hard when a minister is going to take a wife, they can so scrutinize that woman to make sure that she's a virgin because of an isolated verse, because of some comments that Brother Branham made, and I'm for that. Don't you misunderstand me. I'm for that. But I would like to know, are we going to ask the preacher? Are we going to ask the preacher, are you a virgin? How many lovers have you had before you came to Christ? And how is it that you stand behind the holy desk having more than one lover? You do it because the word has purified you. If you've let it, you do it because God has erased your past. You have become one with the word. Why don't we give a sister some grace? Some of you are shocked you heard me say it. It's a very sad condition. I know of some situations where young women promise themselves to young men and, and, and uh, something happened that, that broke the engagement and the pastors would raise up and tell this girl, you can never be married again. So, so rock hard and so solid. But what about the boy? Oh, it didn't matter. 
Because this uh, message world is so hung, you know, on the man can and the woman can't. And they, they, they get so bogged down in their religion. They divide themselves over things that are really not essential. And they forget what the word has done for us. Oh, I believe in being pure. I believe a man ought to take a pure wife if he's going to fill this desk. Don't you misunderstand me. But I also know that none of us have the right to throw stones. It was not whether or not we remain pure all of our lives that made us virgin. It was the pure word of God that set the record straight. Just a minute. Amen, brother. So some of us were married to assembly of God and Methodist and Baptist and Pentecostal. And you don't think I'm going to be married to somebody and not lay with them, do you? Is that too plain? So if I was married to the Methodists, you better know I took what they had to give. Is that too plain? And you did too, Baptist, Pentecostal, whatever brethren, whatever church, Amish bishops or whoever it was. If you were joined to them, you took their seed, you took what they had, and then the word came looking for you. You didn't find this prophet. You didn't find this message. This message found you because God wanted to reverse your wandering way and he wanted to cleanse you. He wanted to make you virgin born born again. That's what he does. That's what the word does. The word and her are the same. Let me just ask, are you still with me? Then let's go back to being liturgical. I say it, you refrain. You come back with a response. Refrain in that, in that context doesn't mean refrain from amening. It means as a reply, as a refrain, you get with me because I want to talk to you in a moment or two about your eyes. You can tell a lot about somebody by looking in their eye. I want you to know there's something happening to the bride's eyes in this hour. She's having some help from on high. Some cataract surgery is taking place. Some reshaping and reforming and remolding is taking place. And a healing and a restoration is taking place in the bride's eyes. And she's going to see clearer now than she has ever seen before. She's going to notice and recognize very quickly when the enemy is trying to sell her a bill of goods. When the enemy is trying to put something on her, some lie, some untruth, some spirit of disqualification, she's going to see that devil. She's going to recognize that snake tail. She may have to do like the apostle Paul and take that viper up. Sling it in the fire and say, you can't have my vision. You can't distract me from the word. I need some help. The word in her the same as a man and his wife becomes one in union. So does the real genuine church of God. When he becomes in Christ, the Bible is punctuated with a every promise. Don't make any difference what the denomination says. The soul that's in the believer punctuates it. Isn't that what I was asking you to do? Because it is the word in him. The word has to punctuate the word. Didn't brother tell us last night we are a word sent from God? Then you can't hear the living word of God and not respond in some way. First and foremost, your faith has to reach up and take a hold of that word. But if you can be so bold as to say a so be it, and amen, you make that word personal in your life. It's not the noise I crave. It's a faith refrain. It's a response that says that's the truth. I'm sticking to it. I don't care what anybody else says. I'm staying with that word. 
The bride church is much loved by the Lord Jesus Christ. As scripture says, he rejoices over his people. When you're worshiping him and you're rejoicing over his goodness and faithfulness to you, if you could see him, If you could catch a vision, a glimpse, I want you to know he is joying over you. He is delighting over you. He is hovering over you like the song told us tonight. What a great privilege and responsibility is ours to be a part of the chosen bride church. The seed is not heir with the shuck. Brother Branham said in paragraph 99, I'm almost done with the quoting, but, I, uh, but uh, not because I don't think it's important. I just wanted to lay it as a foundation. He said, but when you come to say, I and my Father are one, and these other things, that's when the shuck starts pulling away from the seed. Remember? You know, as long as the fish sandwiches were being served, He didn't have a problem pulling in a crowd. As long as Brother Branham was seeing visions and discerning everybody's needs, he didn't have a problem filling up the largest auditoriums in the world. But then the word began to come a little straighter, a little clearer. Hello? Jesus began to talk to his disciples. He began to tell them, you're going to have to eat my my body. You're going to have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And it so stirred some of them that they began to pull away. That shuck will pull away from the seed every time. It's just a carrier. It's just a protector. It's there to protect the seed, to bring it to the hour of its maturity. You know that to be right. But he said the real genuine bride church will bring forth. How about you reading it? The entire. In its. And its. For he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Aren't you glad? You see, this bride church has a responsibility. The bride church is intent on being kept pure from idolatry. I believe you can do better. I'm giving my all. I'm waiting on you to give yours. The bride church is intent on being kept pure from idolatry. There you go. That's sounding better. That means she's not into pastor worship. She's not into church worship. She's not into Brother Branham worship. She lets him be a man. Do you let your pastor be a man? If you don't, you'll never have a leader. The man that God chooses to lead you wherever you worship is going to be a broken vessel. You don't hold him to perfection and infallibility. You let him grow. Some of you have been with me since I was 21 years old. I'm 55 now. We've grown together. You've given me grace and I have given you grace. You have not worshipped me, and if that spirit tried to raise its head here, God knows how. He always knew how to deal with that. If you get to lean in too heavy on your preacher, God knows how to deal with that. A church like some that I love and some that I know of that go all these years and can't find a replacement for their pastor. Something is wrong. You want a carbon copy. And God doesn't have carbon copies. You've got to understand that a mighty man may lead you through a season and another mighty man might have to come and take his place to lead you through a season. We're talking about pastors now. We're not talking about word prophets. I caught your thought. I'm not making an eighth messenger out of anybody. But I'm telling you, you don't worship your pastor. You don't worship the vision of the church. 
Some churches are mission driven. And if they're not careful, they'll worship the mission field. Some churches are Branham driven. It's all they see. They can't even believe that God is going to do something in his bride in the absence of the prophet. So they're waiting to see how it's going to be. They put more confidence in Brother Walker's dream and Brother Junie Jackson's dream than they do in the pure word of the message of the hour. They take these dreams where it's spoken, I'll ride this trail again, and they're hold because Brother Branham's telling the dream, they're holding that to some level of infallibility, and in their own, just like Abraham had an Ishmael, Ishmael was a product of Hagar's womb and Abram's loins. This right here. Now, I know he gave her a natural seed, but it was an idea. The very thing that got us in trouble in the first place was an idea that was full of discrepancy. Anybody with me? And so God had to deal with that. He had to deal. You know, it's a good idea, but just because it's a good idea doesn't mean it's a God idea. I like what brother told us tonight. He kept saying, if God ever does it one time, one way, if he ever does anything similar to that again, he's going to do it just like he did it the first time. Every time. Now, if you raise brother Branham up to the level of Jesus Christ, then no wonder you have to bring him back for a 40-day period of ministry. If you make him Jesus, no wonder you have to believe he's going to return to finish what he started. But it's not a one-man ministry that's going to perfect the bride. It's not press, play, and obey that's going to perfect the bride. The Bible tells us in Ephesians very clearly how the bride is going to come to her perfection. With a five-fold ministry. Apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. Somebody said, you really believe that there are New Testament prophets alive today? If there are not, you and I are sunk. Because Paul, the first church age messenger, said that body will never come to the unity of the faith without the touch of the fivefold ministry. It's going to be a many membered body with a many membered ministry. You need more than apostles, you need prophets too, you need evangelists too, we need teachers too. Somebody said, Where are they? Don't you worry. Our clouded over eyes are going to be clearer as we go forward. And what we're going to find out is that many times they were among us all the time. God had placed them there for such a time as this. They didn't even know what their calling was until the word came alive. Do you know how that kind of a ministry, shoo, forgive me. Do you know how that kind of ministry is birthed? It's not birthed by, by, by opportunities to preach. You can't put somebody in the fivefold ministry by giving them the pulpit. Every brother, every Holy Ghost filled brother in this church ought to be able to take a service. If you're the husband of one wife and you pass the other qualifications that the Bible tells us concerning the elders, every, every brother, every Holy Ghost filled brother, I ought not to have to worry myself to death. And this is fixing to sound pastoral. 
I'm an evangelist tonight. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a guest speaker at this here camp meeting. And I'm about to say some kind of pastoral. But I want you to hear me, and I want you to hear me well. There are so many that feel that call, but I want you to know it takes more than that call. I want to tell you, I want to show you how, how ministry is born. It's not born by practice, although we all need it. We need it. Young ministers especially, they need exposure and they need opportunity. But that ministry, that, that calling, especially to the ascension gifts, and what are they again? Apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. The Bible said that he ascended. He gave gifts unto men. So we call that the ascension gifts. He left something. He ordained something while he was leaving. Apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. Now, you can't train somebody into that. Brother Branham said they're born there. But they may not know it. You may have been born to be a pastor, but you may not know it. Are you with me? You may have been born with a prophetic gift in your life to, to serve the body as a New Testament prophet, but you may not know that. So how do you get that kind of a ministry birthed? You do it in the prayer chapel. You do it in the altar. You do it on the floor here. We call it carpet time. It's when you get down and bury your nose in the rug. That's when we're going to know you're serious about the call of God on your life. Amen. That's where my ministry was birthed. At the foot of my bed as a boy, my ministry, whatever little bit God has given to me, it wasn't birthed by opportunity. It was birthed by wailing. It was birthed by groaning. It was birthed by wrestling. By saying, I'm not turning you loose until you set in order what you have sown in my life. Come on now. And that little bride, she's about to get some clarity in her vision. You're going to see young men. You're going to see young men begin to get serious about the word. They're not just going to look for an opportunity to speak. I said every Holy Ghost filled brother. I ought not as a pastor. I ought not to have to worry. I ought not to have to always clear my schedule with Brother Greeley and him clear his schedule with me to make sure that one of us is here. Any Holy Ghost filled brother in this church ought to have enough of the word in you that if you're called on, you could take a service. Well, what if I didn't preach like you? You better not. You preach like you. You speak like you. There's grace in this house for those who want to start to do something for the Lord. Everybody doesn't have a grandmother that'll just give you the pulpit. You need an opportunity, all right. Let me tell you what God does. He opens doors for those that he puts his trust in. He'll open doors. We need a five-fold ministry. It's not all hanging in the infallibility of one man. Now, I know Brother Branham was not a New Testament prophet. I know that he was more on the order of a word prophet. I know that he was a, a voice. He was a, a spokesman. He was a messenger for the seventh angel. Amen. Only one of those in a generation. Amen. Only one of those to a church age. Are you with me? Yes. May not always fit the chart. You, you know, a, a man's ministry might go a little bit beyond. It might, it might go beyond his death. So people get a little worked up when they start checking the numbers and the messengers that were assigned as the seven church age messengers and they find out that, that one didn't even live in his church age. That ought not to be so, so horrible for you. That ought not to be such. Let me tell you something, especially in an hour like we live today where, where you don't have to be in a, a live ministry there to hear the word of God. You can hear the word of God anytime you want to. But if you want to come to the perfection and unity of the faith, 
You're going to need apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists to do it. Am I making that plain enough? Now, if you're going to make Brother Branham infallible and you're going to say things like he never made a mistake when he says over and over and over again he did, and if you're going to let him misquote a scripture or add two scriptures together and you're going to have to do the same thing because he did, because you don't want to bear some kind of false witness on him and make him look like anything less. So you'll get up, these preachers will get up and they'll misquote the verse because he did. And if you question them, they'll say something like, well, that was God's vindicated voice. So if he said the verse wrong, then it must have should have been that way in the first place. No wonder they have to say there was no, no perfect man like him, no perfect messenger like him. They have to disqualify Paul. Somebody said, I wonder how the prophet would take to this kind of preaching. I want you to know he's waiting on men. He's waiting on this hour for men with a backbone to say you have rallied and run yourself crazy around the signpost. Now it's time to hear the voice and go do what he told us to do. The bride has to have that revival. The bride has to move in the ministry that God has given to her. John the Baptist had to decrease. Are you still here? We've got to be kept pure from all idolatry. You can't worship your mama. She's human. You can't worship your daddy. He's human. You can't pray to pictures. That's icons. That's Catholicism. That's paganism. That's why the Jews have no confidence in Christianity yet. Because all they see is lighting candles and praying to halo pictures. They'll say things like, they'll say things like, well, you know, God loved that man so much that he had his picture made with him. I think that's precious to say. Well, let me tell you how much he loved me. He loved me so much that he came down to live in my body. You don't get any higher honor than that. He loved you so much that he chose to come into you and purify you by his word. So if you don't ever have a halo over your head, if the pillar of fire don't ever physically hang over your head, the prophet said you're more valuable to God than all the angels. You carry as his bride more authority in the earth because you've got the word in you. And if you're still, if you've still got some of you in there, try to get that squeezed out. I'm not saying you're perfect, but I'm telling you the the perfect one is in you. The perfect one is in me. We can't just point people back. We've got to let them understand there's something to see out there. I'm tired of this pest house. So we've got to put away idolatry. No more pastor worship. I hope I'm getting that in there enough. The bride church is intent on making sure that there is not an inordinate love of the world found in her. Because if you love the world, the things of the world, the things of God, they have no place to lodge in you. Come on now. I told you on Sunday, we're going to have to be inconvenienced a little bit for that last move of God. You may have to miss some of your Netflix series. You may have to miss something from time to time. You may have to lay something aside. You may have to get up a little earlier so you can get to church on time and you can get a seat. I know some of you really like your seat. You may lose your seat. There's a way to remedy that. Just get here early enough to claim it. 
then put your little self in it and stay there. Amen. Because what I saw last night, when that spirit of prophecy was stirring in here, what I saw was God saying, bone going to find its bone. God's calling a tribe together. He's calling a tribe together. May he do it everywhere. Somebody said, you you talk like this place is special. What kind of a pastor doesn't feel like that God has placed him in a special place? You know, special can mean a lot of things. No offense, but it can mean you ride on a short bus. No, no offense. Well, ain't he special? That's a nice way to say he's ugly, but I know you love him. You do that to any of the young'uns around here, and you're going to deal with me. Because I have found out that when, some, when, when people are, when folk are bride, God gives them beautiful bride children. Amen. We have some of the most beautiful children and young people in this church anywhere in the world. Somebody said, well, you're probably just a little bit prejudiced. I am not. I know when somebody's got a pretty look about them, the touch of God beautifies. He beautifies the meek with salvation, doesn't he? Hello. So we don't want to be found as the bride church with the love of the world in us. The bride church is concerned with only pure worship directed toward her bridegroom. She's not watching to see what everybody else is doing. She doesn't turn around to look to see who's watching her. We get a little of that sometimes. Don't you do that. Don't you do that. I tell you, when you get into that pure worship, you don't care if your, if your Dunlap is jiggling. You know what that is? That's that part of you that's Dunlapped over your belt. If you wear your pants big enough like I do mine, you won't have that. If you pull them up like they ought to be pulled up, you won't look like these men with their belly hanging down there and their britches down there. Buy you a bigger pair. You won't care if you're done lap jiggles a little bit. When you get lost in that pure worship, it doesn't, you're not thinking about your hair. You're not thinking about, you're just thinking about him. The bride church, the bride church longs for the return of the bridegroom. You, 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 you get around people long enough. I, I, I got to hurry. I totally forgot. You, you, you get around people very long and you'll find out that they talk. That you ask them, do you believe the Lord's coming? Yes, but they don't live like they believe he's coming. They've got a 40-year plan. I believe we ought, to, we ought to plan, you know, I believe that. I believe we ought to have a plan for our future, but I don't believe that's what we ought to be caught up in. We can see, we see how suddenly things can change. On a Monday, a diagnosis came. Not even two weeks later, how many days? Two, two weeks, just two weeks, at two weeks. Two weeks later, our sister gone from us. You have, you, listen. We have no guarantee. The real true bride church, she longs for the return of the bridegroom. She don't say these ridiculous things like, I want the Lord to come, but I want to be married first. I want the Lord to come, but I want to have babies first. Let me tell you something. You get the bridegroom in your vision. And you'll understand that if you let him, he will be everything to you. He fulfills the longing of your soul. He fulfills the deepest desire of your inner spirit. 
Just see him, look to him, find him. The bride church secures her own wedding garment. We read it. And make sure. It's up to you to make sure it stays clean. It's up to you to make sure it stays spotless. Are you with me? As for the Song of Songs, there's much controversy that surrounds that book, and yet it was added to the Bible under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Simply put, it is a song of love between King Solomon and the Shulamite shepherdess. 33 times in the song, we find the word beloved in reference to, or beloved, in reference to the bride and her soon to be groom. 28 times it is the Shulamite girl calling Solomon her beloved. In Song of Songs 2.16, my beloved is mine and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. In Song of Songs 6.3, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. But we know it's much more than just a love song between King Solomon and the Shulamite shepherdess. It's a picture of our heavenly bridegroom pursuing his bride, and it opens up a wellspring of understanding to us. While there are some graphic words, some analogies that some may not understand, it serves to give us great spiritual truth concerning our bridegroom's passionate love for us. I'm in, I am impressed to focus this evening for the little bit of time I have left on one analogy that will give us a real pause if we choose to pursue it. I want to talk about her eyes. The most important organ for finding out about the world around us is the eye. It is used to gain knowledge, appreciate beauty, recognize the bad and the ugly. The Bible connects the eye with our emotions. Lamentations 3.51, the eye affects the heart. Deuteronomy 7.16, the eyes can pity. Job 16.20, the eyes pour out tears of compassion. Psalm 31.9, the eyes can be consumed with grief. Psalm 88.9, the eye mourns. Genesis 3.6, something can be pleasant. And bring pleasure to the eye. Song of Solomon's 4 9, ravish the heart. She ravished the heart of her bridegroom with her eyes. Song of Songs 6 5, your eyes have overcome me. The beauty of an eye can overcome the bridegroom. The Bible also connects, are you with me? The Bible also connects the eye with revelation. Psalm 119, 18, open my eyes to behold your law. Ephesians 1, 17, 18, the eyes of my understanding. Psalm 32, 8, guide me with your eye. Genesis 21, 19, God opened Hagar's eyes. Numbers 10, 31, be to us instead of eyes. 2 Kings 6, 17, God opened the servant's eyes. 1 Corinthians 13, 12, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. So all through the scripture, the Bible corresponds the eye with human emotion. And all through the scripture, the Bible connects the eye, the human eye, perhaps the spiritual human eye, with revelation. There are expressions that we use that concern the eye, and I'm going to go over them real quickly with you. That caught my eye. What does that mean? It means it attracted your attention. Feasted my eyes upon. It means you looked at, looked at something with pleasure and admiration. Gave him the eye. That was my mama. She always gave me the eye. That means to look at, to warn, or with admiration. He has an eye for that. It means have the ability to notice with discernment and appreciation. Sometimes we say in the public eye. That means well-known or brought to public attention. Keep an eye on that. It means look after or watch carefully. Keep your eyes open means be on the lookout, be watchful. Lay eyes on, that means to look at. And I laid my eyes on such a judge. It means you looked at it, right? Make eyes. Have you ever heard somebody say, she made eyes at me? Don't you do that if you're not my wife. Because that means flirt, to look at lovingly. And, and some people will respond to, to, to something. They'll say, my eye. 
Some of you look at me like you've never heard anybody say that before. Lord of mercy, I would, when I was in school, they'd walk up to you, pull their eyes, say, eyeball. What's happening? Eyeball. My eye, it means exclamation of contradiction or astonishment. So there's a lot about our eyes. Would you agree? We got to hurry. That opened his eyes. That means it made him aware of facts and real reasons. See eye to eye. That means hold precisely the same view. See with half an eye. That means to see or understand something easily because it's so evident. Shut his eyes to it means unwilling to see or to think about. So obviously when Solomon declares that he was struck by the eyes of this young woman he wants to marry, he's speaking figuratively. Are you with me? The first thing he says about her eyes is she has dove eyes. Did you hear the song about the dove? Song of Songs 4.1. Don't you leave me yet. I'm not running to part two. I'm going to finish this tonight. Song of Songs 4.1. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. The Bible tells us in Matthew 6.22, the light of the body is the eye. And if therefore the eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is the darkness. Did you know that when a dove fixes its gaze upon its mate, It is never distracted by any activity around it. I said when a dove fixes his or her eye on its mate, it doesn't matter what's happening around them. They lock eyes in such a profound way that sometimes people refer to that, a dove, as being a lovebird. Our having this dove's eye as the bride of Christ indicates that we're becoming increasingly, I've got to slow down. It means that we are becoming increasingly aware of the Lord's person and his presence. And that we possess a spiritual awareness that will lift us above the pools of the earthly For a few moments last night, as the service come to an end, the Spirit of God was still drawing in this place. I knew he was drawing, and I refused to let anybody take it into into warfare or into any kind of violent intercession. That is not where we were. There's a time to war in the Spirit. There's a time to to intercede with, with aggression in the Spirit. And then there's a time to recognize that the dove is over. He's just hovering. Somebody said, well, I don't know what to do in times like that. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything. We make a great mistake. We make, I want to teach you something. We make a great mistake when we think we've got to fill in the void. There's never a void when the dove is hovering over our head. We could sit and look each other in silence. You know that's what lovebirds do. We could just sit and look at one another here in silence as long as the dove is cooing over us. We don't have to scream. We don't have to be loud. We don't have to pound the desk. We don't have to beat a drum. We don't have to wave a flag. We don't have to shake a tambourine. There's a time to do all of that. You know as a pastor here, you know that I believe that the people should have liberty to worship God. Every time the enemy raises his ugly head to try to dictate in this house what worship will be like, God has allowed us to beat him back. You're not going to tell us we can't run or jump or dance or shout or speak in tongues. Or twirl, or wave a flag, or throw a handkerchief. Every time the enemy has come through the years and tried to say you'll be more accepted, hide the worshipers in the back. 
so no streamer sees them. If I was ashamed of the worship here, we would have done something about it a long time ago. I just wanted a place. When my grandmother was leaving this world and God gave her the vision and took her out the spokes of a wheel out into the tragedies of the world, she started in the hub. The hub was the anointing. The Spirit of God carried her out the various spokes of the wheel. She saw disease and famine. She saw world disaster. She saw homosexuality and perversion. She saw so many things just when she would feel like I can't, I can't survive under the weight of how ugly it looks. The Spirit of God would pull her back down the spoke of the wheel and an anchor shah. And anchor her in the hub, in the anointing. She told me the vision the day, the day she died, the morning, the morning that she died, either the morning she died or the morning before she died. It was one of the last spiritual things that she said to me. She said, Steve, you won't believe. You won't believe. It don't matter how black it gets out there. It don't matter how filthy it looks. If you'll always let him bring you back like he was doing me. She said, he brought me back. She said, it was like I was sliding back to the hub. And the anointing just draped me and embraced me and wrapped its arms around me. And all of a sudden, are you with me? And all of a sudden, everything was all right. Uh, 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 jo- uh, Brother Josh Yantis, come in and make it a little warmer. Uh, those people are very, very cold. I'm very hot, but it doesn't matter. I, I, I'm sweaty, but I, I don't want nobody to, to, get, to catch a cold because you can't stay out. You, you can't have a sore throat and lay out. This is, you, you don't want to miss this. Somebody didn't hear the message Sunday. He said, I'm going to give you the Moed. I'm going to give you a divine appointment. I'm going to do something for you this week. He didn't tell tell us what preacher he was going to use because he'll use us all if we yield to him. He didn't tell us what service was going to be the best because they'll all be the best if we get everything out of them we can get. I'm going to do it, brother. I'm going to do it, sister. I'm going to get everything I can get. You've got to know when the Spirit is calling and wooing, and you've got to know when he releases you. To stay one more, to linger one moment longer than the Spirit is wooing you is a waste of your good energy. I lost friends one time at a camp meeting down the hill there under that tabernacle. Because that long after the service was over, there was a bunch of people from, some of them from New Brunswick and from other places, a big majority of them now dead, a big majority of them gone, and some left at very young ages. But there were some of them who had come, and they began to try to, to, to extend what God was. It wasn't that he, that he didn't want to help us. It's that he has a time and a season. For everything. And boy, I, I, left, I began to leave. I began to get, and all of a sudden, the Spirit of God just kind of picked me up, and I ran like a wild man under that, under that tabernacle, and I would go home. I began to scream, go home! Go home! Go back to your hotels! Go back! Get out! I lost friends. People didn't understand. I stayed up half the night in a hotel parking lot by Cracker Barrel, trying to explain to carnal-minded people how that God has an appointment and he has a season. And there's a time to beat the floor and war and fight and push. And there's a time to soak. And there's a time to, to respond to the call. But you see, our religious mentality thinks, if I just pray five more minutes... It won't do you a lick of good when the Spirit is through with the assignment. So don't get your feelings hurt. When, the, when he's through calling, I'm going to the house. Wouldn't be any need. We're go- but don't you worry. Somebody said, well, I, I ain't going to know the difference. You will. You will. Because something, because something's happening. 
God is reforming our eyes. He's reforming our eyes. They'll, they'll come along now and say, the only way to have a move of God is to tarry all night. You can tarry all night and be no closer to him the next morning if God has a set an appointment with you. you got to understand the times and seasons of the Lord. I believe in fasting. I believe fasting is a key for a lot of people in a lot of situations. I believe fasting is one of the only things sometimes that can bust something open. But I don't believe in fasting because you got an idea. I believe, listen, if you're going to really fast, you need to know God is wooing you. He's calling you into time. Somebody said, why would you say something like that? Because we were once on a 21-day Daniel fast here, and some just joined in because others were joining in. And I'm telling you, it turned loose mental sickness, mental illness. It turned loose all kinds of things in the house. Because it's just like Abraham and, and, and Hagar. God gave him a son, but it was a product of Hagar's womb and his loins. I know there are people who believe. I know there are some of you who believe we need to be doing this and we need to be doing that and we need to be doing the other. Let me tell you what we need to be doing. We need to be letting the Lord reform our eyes. I'm telling you what worked in Laodicea will not work where we're going. What worked in the church ages, it won't work where we're going. There is an exodus. There is an exodus. Oh my, do I have some more time? Thank you, thank you. I need a little more, sorry. I may not speak to you again. I don't know how the Lord is going to lead. I know God sent his servant from South Africa. He's starting tomorrow night. We're going to see how, night by night how the Lord leads. This may be my only chance to get my spirit free. I got to get all this stuff off of my fork. Because I'm not going to quit working because I'm not the one standing here. I'm going to work for him and I'm going to work for Brother Greeley and I'm going to work for you just as hard whether I'm standing here or not. I won't, shoo, I feel something. I, I think I'm by myself, but I feel something. I want every service to be what God wants it to be. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what the critics say. I don't care what the fans say. I'm not moved by my fans. I'm not moved by my critics. I'm moved by the Holy Spirit. We must be moved by the Holy Ghost. You'll never get to where God has called you to get if you get stuck in thinking that you've got to run your house. Your church, like everybody else's church. Now, the, the last thing, Brother Austin Hodges, that my grandmother said to me after that experience, she said, honey, I want you to come home. I want you to come home, and I want you to take the church. And I said, Granny, Big Mama, she looked mighty tiny laying in that bed. She had been my big mama all my life. I said, big mama, God's already talking to my heart. Don't say no more. I'm ready to come when he releases me to come. I was in South Carolina at the time. And she said, I want you to promise me one thing. She said, it's not going to be easy. They are going to fight you tooth and toenail. And you will be tempted to leave, to throw in the towel and leave because some of them that has been faithful with me will not be faithful with you. She said, some of them are so mad they could spit a 10-penny nail because I recognize that I wasn't called. And they'll blame you. Remember my grandmother all those years of ministry. And she heard, I said, but big mama, if he is that Elijah, if, he, if that spirit and power of Elijah is on him, we'll have to do what he said to be right, won't we? Yes, ma'am. I said, but big mama, the Bible said that a woman is not supposed to, to handle the word of God and usurp authority over a man in that way. And she said, oh, I never thought of it quite like that. I'll never do it again. 
You saw it. You've read the testimony. And so I said, I will come in God's perfect time. And she said, I want you to promise me one thing. I want you to have a church. It don't have to look anything like the church that I started because I was doing God a service. You're going to be in his will. I want you to build a church where uh, somebody can call the name of Brother Branham and never be afraid that somebody is going to get their little feelings hurt and so they won't tell the whole story because they're afraid of driving somebody off or running. I want you to have a church where you can call Brother Branham's name and give testimony and, 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 and uh, let him be what God called him to be without, without embarrassment or without shame. And I want you to have a church where people can worship God according to the dictates of their heart and nobody is going to tell them how to worship God. She said, as long, of course, as it's decent and in order. She said, some people may hold their hands like this. Some may hold them like that. Some may only dance when the Spirit of God moves on them. Some may dance as a sacrifice of prayer. They may just dance because they're happy. But my desire for this church, you don't have to make it like I had it. You be led by the Spirit. But these two things I want you to do. Be free to call Brother Branham's name and let the people be free to worship God. Pure worship, undictated. We're not doing it to be seen. Anybody with me? Dove's eyes, single eye. I guess I'll have to stop. I don't know what I'll do because I'm not done. Having this dove's eye indicates that we are becoming increasingly aware of the Lord's person and presence and that we possess a spiritual awareness that will lift us above the pools of the earth. The single eye, the single eye will enable us to become sensitive to the Lord's presence and obedient to his desires and purposes. You can't call someone else into your experience. I see intercessors trying to do that sometimes. You think because you've got a burden that everybody is supposed to have a burden. That's not right. That's subtle manipulation, and it borders on witchcraft. You don't model your intercession after somebody else. You don't model your worship after somebody else. You may be weeping, but don't try to make somebody else weep. I don't even know why I'm preaching the way I'm preaching now. But I, I know it looks like, I know it looks like, I know we think it ought to be that we all do the same thing all the time. I know that's what we think unity is. But unity is when everybody, Mary, Mary, what are we going to do? We've run out of wine. What are we going to do? She said, well, honey, child. I don't know what to do. It's not my wedding feast. I'm a guest here. I tell you what, whatever he tells you to do. You going to stay with me? You, you are or you're not getting no soup and sandwich. Ain't no to go plates. Except for seniors. Mm-hmm. I don't, know what, I don't know what to tell you to do. We're out of wine. Yeah, that's right. We're out of wine. But you go, I believe this will work. You go find him and whatever he tells you to do. If you're around this altar and he tells you to jump, I hope you look like a kangaroo. But you better jump. We had a prophetic guy come here one time and he, he didn't understand our jumping and he kind of made a little bit of fun. He did. You know he did. He made a little fun, called it a kangaroo anointing. I don't care what you call the anointing that's on me. That's your business. You better be careful. But that is totally up to you. But if, if he tells me to jump, the only way for me to get wine is by jumping. 
You may be standing right beside me and he may tell you to weep. You may feel your heart breaking and you may need wine and you may only get wine. You may not get wine jumping because I jump. But if he breaks your heart and you begin to weep, that's the way you'll get your wine. He may tell somebody to walk about Zion. He may not tell us all to walk about Zion, but if he tells you to walk about Zion, you don't have to go bring somebody else to walk with you. You can't. I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to address those of you that have you know, tried to encourage people in. I understand that altogether, but I want you to know they can do what you do and may not get the wine. The only way for us to have that wine is to do what he tells us to do. And if you're worried that you're not going to know, don't worry. Don't worry. He's given us dove's eyes, single eyes. We're going to learn how to lock our eyes on the bridegroom. And it ain't going to matter who's having an earthquake around us. Somebody may be over there in the corner and they may be having a typhoon revival. They may be spinning like a tornado. But you may just be standing there spiritually with your eyes locked on him. And if your eyes are locked on, your dove's eyes are locked on the bridegroom, you lay there right there. Stay right there. Keep your focus. Single eye will enable us to be sensitive. The Lord's favor rests upon those who have cultivated a single eye toward him. These can be easily led by him, for they are close enough to see which way his eye is looking. Now, a few, few weeks ago, uh, somebody came to me, and they said, someone told me that they had a, an assignment to stand in a particular place, and I don't believe in that. Well, let me tell you something. It's not your assignment. God don't have to explain to you. Oh, I don't know if that's Bible or not. Let me show you how, how much Bible it is. What about him, Lord? What about him, Lord? What about John? How, how, come, how come you let him do like that? Jesus said, if I would that he tarry till I come, which means if I decide that he does not taste natural death. What business, what is it to you? Do you know one of these days John may walk in? If I would that he tarry till I come. He, he might be somewhere in a cave like the Madaraji. He may be hiding somewhere. It might have only been spiritual. It might have been natural. I don't know which it was. So don't you try to throw another stone. But he just said, if I wanted him to be alive, when I get back, what is it to you? Follow me. Isn't that what he said? Follow me. If you don't understand something, if you'll let me as your pastor, I'm not supposed to be ministering as a pastor tonight. I am. If you let me, I'll try to teach you what I know. You think you know it all? I don't know it all. But I will tell you this. I have learned a thing or two. And I didn't learn it in the seminar. And I didn't learn it in the conference. And I didn't learn it with a set of CDs. I learned it with carpet time. You see, prayer is not what I do. Prayer is who I am. And you're going to learn as a part of that bride that prayer is who you are. Because your eye focus, your eyes are about to be transformed a bit. Oh, me. Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, Philippians 2, 14, 15 talk, talks about being humble and harmless. And Matthew 10, 16, wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We've got to learn some things by the Spirit. And I was going to re read a, a quote there from God making his promise. Read it at home, paragraph 34. Flash it up. 
Just flash it up. I don't have time. Just, I'll, just read the, I'll just read the yellow. There's nothing like the dove. The dove is a lover. The dove coos in the evening. There's nothing more beautiful than to hear the dove in the evening cooing. The turtle dove. Let him coo. Let him coo. Let him coo over here. Turn off the idiot box. And let the dove coo over you. It's not just for women to be lovers. It's not just for women to lay at the feet of Jesus. It's not just for women to want to know his heartbeat. It's not just for women to put their head on his chest so they can hear his heartbeat. John was our example. You sit wherever you want to sit. You sit at the back door if you want to. You sit on the back row if you want to. But John said, you don't have to like me. You don't have to like it. You don't have to like my position. I'm not sitting there for you. I want to be as close to him as I can. What did the prophet say about this desk right here? That's the closest you can get. John said, I, I, know, I know they're going to call me. I know what they're going to say. I know they're going to say I want the attention. I know they're going to say I think I'm better than they are. But I cannot afford for his heart to beat and me not know what he's beating to. God is a lover. God is love. God wants you to come down. Last part of that paragraph. God wants you to come down. God wants to come down and make love to you. Somebody say, ooh, you're missing it. Ooh, there is no sensation in this world. There is no sensation in this world. There is nothing in this life. There is no feeling in this life that can compare to when God Almighty by the Holy Ghost comes and makes love over the promise of his word in you. Come on now. Brother Benham said he woos and he coos. He's trying to get some of your starchy hearts to make love to you. He's seeking, thirsting, hungering, trying to get to some of your starchy hearts to make love to you as a love affair. Not a law. I can just hear him. Preacher, announce I'm getting married. Is she a virgin? Are you? Law. Law. Everybody, law. I know because I was a part of it. I know what it means to be legal. When the very thing you preached against is the thing that God hangs on your face. You'll understand how to humble yourself a little bit. Oh, they've tried. They, po they post comments on pictures sometimes. They send me inboxes. They tell me how good looking I was. Well, I was never good looking. But they tell me how good looking I was before these whiskers. Yeah. Sister Vaughn grabbed my beard when I was out there in, in Tucson, and she shook, and he said, she, you look so much better with that, w without that thing. Let me tell you something. If I was doing it to look good, it'd be a totally different situation. I did it because he called me. He told me first, I'm going to make you a gazing stock. And then he called me to do it for a purpose, purpose not yet all revealed. I'm going to do what he said. I have to do what he said if it means backpedaling. He didn't tell you to do it necessarily. You don't do it because I do it. You don't have to do what I do. You don't have to wear a vest because I wear a vest. I wear one to help cover up my belly. You don't have to wear one because I wear one. You don't have to have a bolo tie because Brother Branham did. You don't have to wear cowboy boots because he did. Go find out what he tells you to do. Do it, do it, do it, do it. Not a law, but love. And then I wanted to preach on the apple of the eye, but I don't have time. I'll, I'll be back. I'll be back sometime. Sunday week, if no, if no sooner than that. I want to get to the, I want to talk a little bit about that apple of the eye. I want to show you that in Hebrew. Most of you have heard it before. 
And you know what it means if the Lord says, you, you know, you touch the apple of my eye. That's that little image. It's that little, little image that, that appears in the pupil uh, of what somebody's looking at. Did you know if you get close enough to somebody, you can look at their pupil and see yourself? That word in Hebrew, that's exactly what it means. It means the little man in the pupil of the eye. In your case, it might be a little woman in the pupil of the eye. Haven't we told you over and over again, you become what you gaze at, what you look at, you become like? Don't you know God set us free some years ago and said, you're, you're still looking at the mirror of the law. You're still seeing your shortcomings because you're looking at the law, and, and you're not even supposed to be seeing your, your blemish. You're supposed to be seeing my image in the mirror, not your image. Your image in the mirror can't change you. Your image is the ugly truth. When you see the wrinkles, they're there. They're really there. It's not a trick mirror. I'm closing. It's not a trick mirror. We're no later than we were last night yet. It's not a trick mirror. It's telling you what you really look like. And if you think it's going to help you to know, believe me, you hit double grace, 55, and I don't always need to know what I look like. Because sometimes there's not a whole lot you can do about it. The one thing I know is I'm not going to diminish a wrinkle or turn one gray hair back to brown by looking in the mirror. You're not going to have power to change your life, to set yourself free, to deliver yourself, to be more like him by looking at how, how, what reality says about your image. But if you'll look at his image... If you'll see the stature of the perfect man in the mirror, if you'll see the perfect reflection of the perfect word looking back at you, if when you look in the mirror you see Jesus instead of yourself, you've got something to, to, to pull up to, you've got something to, to, to reach a hold of. He's the man in the mirror. If you're still the man in your mirror, you're going to miss this thing. And how do you become the apple of his eye? He's got to be looking at you. And he said, if they touch you, they have touched the apple of my eye. Let me tell you what God's saying. They're, he's saying, they didn't put, they're not putting, let me tell you something. They take you apart. They're touching the apple of his eye. They didn't put you in God's eye. He chose what to look at. He chose you. I'll finish this another time. He chose you. He'll look at you if he wants to. Amen. Don't matter what anybody else says. If he's looking at you and you're the little man in his eye, if you're the little reflection in his eye, don't matter what anybody else thinks about you. When they touch you, they're touching him. When they're condemning you, they're condemning him. When they're judging you, they're judging him. Hello, 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 hello. And then I'll come back and talk to you about those fish pools in Heshbon. I spent all day today in those fish pools. Let me give you just this, this little touch. Yes, Lord, speak. We're hearing you. Hello. <laughs> Thy, thine eyes are like the fish pools of Heshbon. He made an, an, uh, an analogy. The bride's eyes are like the fish pools of Heshbon. You begin to do a little research. Don't. Let me do it for you. Then you go check me out. And where are they located? Those fish pools in Heshbon were located in the, in the geographical location of the tribe of Reuben. Our brother was talking tonight about the tribe of Judah. That's such a powerful tribe. But Reuben was the firstborn of Leah. And the word she cried out when, when Reuben uh, arrived, she didn't say, ain't everything going good. She said, the Lord has seen my affliction. She was trapped in a painful life. She knew she wasn't the first love. She knew she had become a baby factory for somebody that didn't love her like he loved the other wife. 
Even a brand new baby couldn't bring her the joy that it would bring somebody else. And she cries out at the birth of Reuben, the Lord has seen my affliction. So Solomon is telling us, if we go through the detail, and we will, I want to, I want to share that with you. We find out that Solomon is telling us that our eyes, the bride's eyes, are being formed by her afflictions. It's, it's not her joys that fixes her focus on him. Oh, no. We're swimming in the fish ponds of Heshbon. We're over there in the land of Reuben where our affliction is what we see sometimes. You know, there's some mamas that have had some babies that couldn't have the joy that other mamas had because they were born into homes where there was no peace. Somebody ought to think about what they're doing. I know you'll be mad at me. I've actually told a few people, why don't you just quit having babies by someone who doesn't love you and treat you right? Somebody said, Brother Shelley, that's not your decision. No. Somebody said, Brother Shelley, that, that's not her decision. Wait just a minute. You think a woman is nothing but a baby factory? You can take this out of the tape. You think a woman's nothing but a baby factory? You think a woman in her right mind is going to keep having babies to be raised by an atheist? There are some women that have had to bring some babies into this world in, in hard times. In affliction, everybody didn't have the joy that some of us had. When we look, sometimes we see this beautiful gift from God, and sometimes a mama looks and she says, It's just going to be so hard to raise him in the environment of our home. Nonetheless, the Lord opens and shuts the womb, and the Lord gives and takes away. Blessed be his name. Are you following me here? So don't, don't make a doctrine where I didn't make one. I'm just being very, very honest. I'm being very, very honest here. And there does come a time that we have to make a decision and realize that it's, it's not necessarily our job to do it all. Let somebody else do a little replenishing. Because we need to be able to spiritually, emotionally, and financially provide for the little lives that we bring into the world or else it's not going to be a joy for every mama. Some mama's going to wonder how we're going to have enough. How are we going to pay the dentist? How, how, how are we going to buy the milk? How, how are we going to fix it? Come on. The bride's eyes are not being formed by the joy. They're not being focused and reshaped by, by the pleasure. They're being reshaped by the affliction. Somebody's been spending time in the fish ponds of Heshbon. And they're going to come out with a focus like never before. They're going to see their bridegroom like they've never seen him before. God is not going to let you suffer here and then rob you of the reward. He may choose as he did for my royal jelly. I spent time yesterday reading my files from Sister Weems and from Royale. For years after she came here, she signed every card wrote every card to my big brother. Older than me she was. But she was calling me her big brother. And as soon as I gave her that nickname, Royal Jelly, she signed him. Royal Jelly. I, I had some Royal Jelly one time. 
and it changed my life. It's powerful stuff. And I said to her, you're powerful. You're healing like royal jelly. When you think about her life, don't pity her now. If you had any sympathy, I hope you showed it to her when she drug her foot to get in God's house. But you don't have to feel sorry for her now. She's no longer swimming in the fish pond of Heshbon. She no longer swims in the murky waters of suffering and affliction. She has the reward. I wanted her to have it here. But God didn't consult me. He didn't ask me. He didn't bother to give me a voice. He said, I'm going to give her the reward of her, of her time in the, in the affliction. I'm going to give her, but I'm going to do it over here. And you know what I heard the Lord say? Because I know her story. My files tell her story. I know her story. I know what she went through. I know that every smile cost her a big price. It didn't come easy. It came with a price. I read a letter from her accuser. You may think that nobody ever had an unkind word to say to her, but I want you to know I have the letters. And she was called just about anything you'd want to call somebody. And she probably shed some tears over the names that she was called. But she learned Affliction is for a purpose. Suffering is for a reason. Everything gets to going good. You may forget where you come from. You may forget the God who, who helped you the way he did. You may forget the goodness of God. You may forget. You may forget. Musicians are coming. Jacob wrestled with the Lord. God dislocated his hip. The Jews today will not eat a piece of meat that is not cut by a kosher butcher because they refuse to eat the hollow of his hip. They won't eat. They're careful even with the loin of a, a loin of beef because they don't want to eat a piece of meat that may have rubbed up against the hip of the cow because they remember that Jacob had a revival. He had a revival. He had a meeting with God. Oh, I tell you what, I wish some of us would have a revival like Jacob had. You get up from that kind of a revival, wrestling with the angel of the Lord, your hip dislocated by the angel of the Lord. And you know what? It never did get right. He was never the same. God changed him. He spent some time down there in Reuben. Affliction. And he never walked right after. We can spiritualize that all day long. It was. It was a spiritual transformation. It was a limp to remind him of his meeting with God. Sometimes God just leaves enough of the scar to always remind us what it's like to meet him. I'm refraining. There's so much more I'd like to say right here, but it gets a little too personal. 
May God encounter us this week. May he grab a hold of us and we grab a hold of him. May it not just be that, that he's our beloved, but may we recognize I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. My, my wedding ring cost $3.33. Yes, sir. Three for 10. It's all I've needed. I might have another one one day, but it, this one has kept me married. <laughs> I'm closing. I never, never had to take it off to hide the fact I was married. In fact, the only reason why I ever put it on in the first place is because I was doing some preaching and speaking among non-message people and the, and the old divorced women kept hitting on me. I know you can't imagine that. I mean, I know it grosses you out. And I was in, at the Ramon Crater in Jerusalem and a young beautiful prostitute come up to me and she asked me if I wanted a date. And I said, lady, I'm married. She said, well, you didn't have on a wedding ring. And I thought to myself, I bet the next time you see me, I'll have one on. <laughs> so I went down to the little Arab shop and I was able to get, uh, uh, I, I just can't, I, I'm going to Israel the last uh, of this month uh, for a few days, God willing. And I, I was just reminiscing the other night with the family sitting around. I wonder, will my f Arab friends be there? I've not been in 11 years, almost 12. It's crazy how time flies. I wonder, will my, will my falafel man still be in the same spot? You know, you start having these thoughts. And it says on here, my beloved is mine in Hebrew, and I'm his. I want you to have that re revelation. You think he's beautiful? How many of you think the Lord's beautiful? Let me tell you something, folks. He thinks that you are altogether lovely. He thinks you're the most beautiful thing he's ever seen in his, his whole existence. My beloved is mine. Uh, sometimes I say, you're beautiful, Jesus. And, and, and a man, a big macho, bulky man, big, you know, bow-legged man that really thought he was you know, on a testosterone high. He said to me, don't you feel strange when you're saying you're beautiful, Jesus? I said, no, I don't. And the only reason why you do is you've never seen him because if you ever get a glimpse, if you ever get a glimpse, you'll think that's the most beautiful. He's the most beautiful. There's nobody that can compare. There's nothing that compares to the beauty of the Lord. And every time I tell him that, do you know he longs to tell me? I don't see your Dunlap. I don't see your wrinkle. You're beautiful to me. How could he say that? Because it's his beauty. It's his beauty that makes you beautiful. Let's stand. 942, yeah, I went longer. Joshua, you were right, I did. Part two will follow eventually. I, uh, I, I spent all day with him, and uh, well, there's just nobody better. He, he's the best company. I love my wife. I love my children. I love my family. I'd rather be with my family than anything I can think of. I love to eat with them. I, I even like it sometimes when they bicker, but my wife don't. Makes her nervous. It only makes me nervous when they raise their voices. But sometimes when they're just going at one another, all in love, because how do you know? Because it always ends okay the next day sometime, but it's always okay. 
And sometimes I just sit right in the middle of it and I think I'm the most blessed man, Lord Jesus. When I came to pastor this church, I didn't think I would ever have a wife. I told you that we're here in the beginning. I, let me love your children. Because I don't know if I'll ever have any children of my own. So I loved the ones we had. And God gave me a wife to love me and four children to love me and me to love. And I love being with them. Even when they pick the peas out of the rice. But I'd rather spend time in his presence with him whispering on my shoulder than anything I can think of. And I was sitting in the recliner today by myself going over this, putting this uh, together for tonight. And I saw an open vision. And what I saw before me, I knew exactly what it was. It was the image of the broken pieces of a kaleidoscope. If you've ever picked a kaleidoscope up and, and looked in it, you see those little fractals, those little broken pieces of glass that look chaotic. It looks like just a, a mess. But I saw open eye those little fractals just lay it, you know, just laying in a little pile. I, I didn't physically pick up my hand, but I saw, I saw the picture. As it got clearer and clearer and clearer, and every little piece of glass went to its piece of glass. Every little desire, every color found its color. And the next thing I know, it had been focused. What do you call it? I don't know. Focused enough that a beautiful picture was there. And the Lord said, it was there all the time. He said, now that's what I'm going to do for my bride. I'm going to reform her eyes. I'm going to reshape her eyes. I'm not going to let her afflictions be wasted. I'm not going to let her trials, like God talked to you about your loneliness last night. I'm not going to let her loneliness be wasted. I am reforming. I am reshaping. I am remolding her eyes. I'm going to give her a clearer vision. I'm going to let her see more clearly than she's ever seen before. What has looked like chaos to her, what has looked like confusion to her, what has looked like a mess to her is going to begin... Uh, to find a clearer pattern and a, and a picture is going to be made clear. Amen. And I'm out. I'm done. Come. Lord, focus our eyes. We don't want to waste. We don't want to waste not one trial, not one heartache. What you're going, hear me. What you're going through right now is not in vain. This long year, what you've been through. Some of you that came here from other places, you've been here a little over a year. Some of you are just now getting here. It's not all been easy for you. You face some very difficult times. It's hard leaving your loved ones. It's hard leaving your family behind. It's hard leaving your friends behind, coming to a new place. And I don't, I don't, I can't help it that God chose to send you to such a strange place as this. But I know that it's not all been easy for you. But I want you to know the same promise is yours. You're a part of this body now. It is not in vain. Your squeezing, your difficulty, your clash, it is not in vain. God is surely doing the same thing for you that he's doing. He's using the years of your affliction. He's using the things that you have been through to refocus. He's good. Would you raise up your hands and ask him 
to transform your vision, to give you dove eyes, to give you single vision, to give you eyes like the deep fish ponds of Heshbon in the land of Reuben. Give me, give me eyes. So fixed on you that I can see you in the storm. I can see you in the diagnosis. I can see you in the heartache. Just play what you're going to play softly. Tune me, tune me. Ziggy, I hear the Lord calling to you right now. He wants to focus. He wants to give you dove eyes. Don't be discouraged. The pain of your past is the preparation for your tomorrow. Let him do it. Don't go home like you came and I think you came in good shape. Don't go home like you came. Go home in better shape. There's nothing like being in love with him. There's nothing that can fulfill your heart like being in love with him. Sister Mary, the Lord is talking to you. Let him do it. Let him give you dove eyes. Let him show you it's been for a reason. He never makes a mistake. Let him talk to you. Draw me my beloved. Let me look into your face. My beloved is mine, and I am his. Draw me close to you. Draw me, my beloved, into your Let me look into your face, my beloved is mine, and I am his. Draw me close to you. Come on, let's worship oh, you. Come on. Draw me, my beloved, into Push down your close. Draw me, my beloved. Let's come and stand. Let me look into your face. My beloved is mine, and I am his. Let's tell it. Draw me close. Nothing is more important to than you, Lord. Let me see something I never saw before. My beloved is I've looked at the devastation. I've looked at the heartache. I've looked at the confusion. I have remembered the grief. But when I look at it next time, Lord, let me see beauty me for the ashes. Beloved, into your embrace. Draw me my Let beloved. me see you making an army. Let me look into where a your graveyard face. is being. My beloved is mine. And when I, I felt so lonely, his. let me see you there. Draw me close. Remind to me that you were there. You oh, long to embrace me. Draw me my beloved. You long to draw me into your embrace. Draw me, 
Draw me my beloved He loves you Let me look into your face You are beautiful my to him beloved is mine And I am his Let God recreate your history Draw me close Let him reform your past to you Oh, draw me my beloved If God beloved, gives you a limp if he allows you to keep limping, it's to remind you. Draw me my but I believe there are many scars. Let me look into your many face, handicaps my that God wants to erase from your history. And I am many heartaches. Draw many pains. Me close he wants to wipe them out. To you. He wants to clean your memory. He wants to paint your mind with Calvary's blood. Stretch your heart to him. Come on, let him do it. Try to forget the hour. Try to forget the time for just a moment. Blow upon my garden that the spices may flow out. You're beautiful to him. My beloved is mine. And it's not all lost. It's not all lost. Draw me close. It's not all lost. Let him restore, let him renew, let him refresh. And draw me, my beloved, Shut up on into your embrace. Draw us, Lord, draw me, my beloved. Let me look He's stirring. into your The Holy your Ghost face. is stirring his finger. My beloved He's stirring you with his finger. The Holy Ghost is stirring you with his finger. Draw me close. Be thorns. He's moving. Draw me my Let him pour oil on your church hurt. Let me look into your face. Let him pour oil on that right my now. Is mine. Your disappointment and that things didn't turn out the way you wanted them to turn out. Let him pour oil on that right now. It's okay. It's okay. Because he's still your beloved. My beloved is mine, and I am his. Draw me, my beloved. He feeds among the lilies. You want to find him, you'll find him in the lilies. Let me look into You want to find him, Solomon said, you'll find him in the field. You don't always find him in the building. You find him in the sukkah. You find him in the hut. You may not find him in the in the church house even, but he'll wait for you in the field. He wants to make himself known to you. God's doing something right now. I know it's quiet. Don't you let that offend you. He's stirring. He's stirring. Lord, I want to thank you. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for how you brought me through. Can you see his faithfulness? Can you see that there was only one set of footprints in the sand? When you thought you were by yourself, when you thought nobody knew, when you thought you'd been left alone and you needed him the most, you saw that one set of footprints and thought they were yours? Let him show you tonight. Let him refashion your eyes. Let the bride's eyes be refashioned tonight. And let him show you those were his footprints. How is that possible? He had you on his back. He picked you up like a sack of taters. He drew you up to his own body and held you. That's his love for you. Let me look into your face, my Even in that hour when you stepped out of his will and you stepped out of his way, he didn't leave you. Draw me close to me. Let's love on Jesus right now. Come on. Draw me, my Draw me. Into your river, draw me, 
to come and lay hands on you but I don't want to be guilty of espousing you to me I don't want to make you ever think that it's me you need nor my gift nor my hand nor my oil Paul said I have espoused you to one I want you to know that the one who knows you best loves you most. And he knows how to heal your hurting heart right now. He is doing it. He is doing it right now. For those of you who can believe, he is healing you. There's some healing taking place right now. Let him do it. I am his. Come on. And draw, draw me, me, my beloved. Draw me into your embrace. I want you to draw, draw me. Draw me, my beloved. Pull me up to Let your side. Let me look Lord. into your face. My beloved is Let mine. Let me rest under your shoulder, Lord. upon your arm, O oh God. And draw me, my beloved, into your embrace. Let me draw see me that I'm in in the palm of your Let hand. Let me look into your face. My beloved is mine. And I Thank you for the healings that are taking place even now. you are present. You have drawn us tonight. You have drawn us.
some have responded. Healing's taking place in them. Places that they didn't want to go. But you beckoned and they responded. You are healing. Thank you for the salve of the Holy Ghost. Draw me, my beloved, into your embrace. over your people as they would go to their homes tonight. The fellowship that we may have, may you be so close to us. May the food be sanctified that we can partake of it and receive nourishment. We thank you for what you are doing here even now. We give you glory and honor and praise in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. you finished I'd like to be dismissed you're welcome to leave at any time draw me my beloved service tomorrow night at seven o'clock oh my beloved let me look into your face my beloved is mine I am his. Draw me close. Father, I thank you that you continue your work. Even in the night season, Lord. You continue your work. I love you, my beloved. Thank you for the drawing of your Holy Spirit. You know who belongs to you, Lord. You continue the drawing process.
lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King. again Take joy, my King. 